Today our goal is to talk about spies during the Cold War, uh, both spies for the United States and against the United States. So we'll look at American spies and Russian spies and some of the more famous spy cases in history and how that affected life in America and the way we view things in America. So first, uh, the first spy case we're going to look at is the case of Elgar Hiss. And uh, Elgar Hiss worked for the State Department, uh, which is the part of our government that handles foreign policy. They handle negotiations with other countries. Uh, and he was a worker at the Yalta Conference. He worked very closely with FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and a lot of the information he gained, uh, he, was, he was negotiating on behalf of the president, and he would come back to the president to uh, give him summaries and information of what he learned while he was at the Yalta Conference. And so this is kind of a big deal. It means that the president was going to listen to him. It also means that the president has a lot of trust in him. Many of the decisions that the president is going to make are going to be at the suggestions of Alger Hiss. <clears throat> so long after the conference is over in 1947, uh, it turns out that he is accused of being a spy for the communists, a spy for the Soviets. People will claim that he passes secret documents to Soviet handlers and uh, that essentially many of the, the things that he is going to say at the Yalta Conference are going to be sympathetic to the Soviet Union and the, the communist cause. And so um, kind of greatly impacting the way that the president thinks. And that's kind of a big deal if everything that you're doing is, is done with the slant that uh, it may be against capitalism or against the United States. So they find out about this, but the problem is uh, there is what is known as a statute of limitations. Uh, what that means is that um, there are some crimes where after a certain amount of time passes, you can't be put on trial for that. So for example, espionage, you have to be put on trial within a certain number of years. Otherwise, that evidence can't be used against you. And unfortunately for the American government, we found out about Elgar Hiss just a little bit too late to put him on trial for espionage. That being said, that doesn't mean that we couldn't put him on trial at all. Uh, instead, what we put him on trial for is perjury, for lying under oath. Uh, he's put on the stand. He's asked, were you a Soviet spy? He says, no, I wasn't. He is clearly lying. That is perjury. Uh, that is against the law. And so he is eventually found guilty and sentenced to 10 years in jail. Now, on the one side, what this shows us is that we do have communist uh, that we do have communist spies in the U.S. government. There is proof that there are people who are trying to influence the American government. Uh, on the other side, uh, a, a little-known member of Congress, Richard Nixon, um, he he kind of was in charge of all this, and he starts building his reputation based on putting Alger Hiss in, in prison, uh, so he will have an impact on that, but you don't need to know that for the test. Just a little fun fact about Nixon. The next thing we see is this, September 3rd, 1949. So yeah, that's a nuclear bomb, um, but anybody know what this is or why it matters? Take a guess. I'll give you a second to write it down. Well, yes, that is the Soviets dropping their first atomic bomb. And, uh, well, why it matters, um, they're, they're currently uh, five years ahead of schedule. We had spies within the Soviet government, and we, we knew roughly how long it would take to build an atomic bomb. After all, uh, we built an atomic bomb, and they are way ahead of schedule. There's no way that the Soviets should have ever had a bomb ready this quickly, which that can only mean one thing. You guessed it. There are spies. People are spying on the American government. We know there must be a leak within the American government, and so it becomes the task of our government to try to figure out who that leak is and how they got to where they're at, which brings us to the Rosenbergs. So in 1951, 
Um, there was a guy named David Greenglass. Uh, David Greenglass was a worker at the Los Alamos Labs. He was a worker on the Manhattan Project. He was accused of stealing atomic secrets and then passing them along to his sister. Uh, his sister was a woman named Ethel Rosenberg. And so, for example, in the photo, you see a, a little bit of one of the sketches of some of the atomic secrets that David Greenglass was stealing and passing along to his sister. And, um, well, a little bit about his sister. So Ethel was married to a, a gentleman named Julius, and Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, they were members of the Communist Party of the United States. Um, they were openly communist. Uh, they, they didn't really make any secret about that. However, when they were accused of stealing secret documents, they claimed that they were innocent. They claimed that they did not do it. So your next goal is to read the Rosenberg trial reading, which can be found on Moodle on my classes under unit number seven, assignments and activities, Rosenberg trial reading. Uh, I believe you had to do that for homework. So you've already done a T-chart on the worksheet that you got, but what I want you to do now uh, is tell me, do you think the Rosenbergs were guilty? Do you think there was enough evidence to find them guilty? And I want you to explain that right now. So one of the big things that they talk about is the jello box. The jello box uh, was essentially accused of being a key. So with the way that the jello box was cut, it was cut here, and then here, and then here, and that the different spots, they could put together their segments of the jello box, and if they put them all together, that, that was a sign that they could be trusted. At least that is what the prosecution, um, at least that's what the prosecution was accusing. So I've got another question for you. Do you think that they have enough evidence to put the Rosenbergs to death? And most importantly, I want you to explain your answer. Well, so the results of the trial, in case you're wondering, here they are. One of the greatest peacetime spy dramas in the nation's history reaches its climax as Julius Rosenberg and Morton Sobel, convicted of revealing atomic secrets to the Russians, enter the federal building in New York to hear their doom. Another of the spy ring, Mrs. Ethel Rosenberg, who with her husband was convicted of actually transmitting the secrets to Russia through Soviet diplomatic channels. The ring was first uncovered following the arrest of Klaus Fuchs in England. David Greenglass, Mrs. Rosenberg's brother, confessed theft of the secrets while stationed at the Los Alamos Atomic Project. He later became the government's chief witness in the prosecution of Sobel and the Rosenbergs. It is a stern jurist they face in Judge Irving Kaufman. After administering a tongue lashing in which he charged them with the indirect death of thousands of men in Korea, he sentenced both Rosenbergs to death in the electric chair and Sobel to 30 years in prison. At the time these pictures were made, Greenglass still had to hear his fate. It is the first time in peacetime that such a death penalty has been handed down. And while appeals to the highest courts are planned, it certainly appears that the spies are headed along a one-way street. So there you have it. The Rosenbergs were indeed found guilty, and they were sentenced to death. Um, but, but that doesn't mean everything went smoothly for the prosecution. Uh, in fact, there were a lot of people who protested. They believed that Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were innocent. In fact, the Rosenbergs claimed that they were innocent, claimed they knew nothing about the, the atomic bomb secret. Uh, they they claim that they were being framed and hated just because they were communist. Uh, we see things like this. Do not permit hysterical fear to override justice. And so a lot of people thought that they were getting a raw deal. However, despite the fact that a lot of people thought that they were getting a raw deal, June 19, 1953, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg will die in the electric chair at Sing Sing Prison tonight. Yes, that's it. They were found guilty. They were sentenced to death, and, and they were actually killed. <clears throat> they were actually put to death. And this was very controversial at the time because, again, a lot of people thought that they were innocent. So that begs the question, were the Rosenbergs actually guilty? In Washington and New York, we knew that they were over, but we knew they were there. These were complex and ciphered and counted messages, but when we were able to break those messages, we learned various interesting things about what KGB was up to. One of these messages explains in their own words 
what you really think Rosen person is doing, that's, that's how, how we knew he was stealing the secrets. Because they, they said he was stealing the secrets. We, we couldn't use that, that information to prosecute him because they would have realized we were reading the messages and then they would have changed their system and we would have lost um, you know, lost the ability to read. So they, they had to sit on that and they found another way to show how they knew what he was up to before he was finally arrested, prosecuted, and executed. So there you have it. They were guilty. And the reason why we knew they were guilty is, well, we were kind of spying on them, too. And uh, we just didn't uh, we didn't want to blow it. We, we didn't want to admit to them that uh, we were spying on them because then they would the Soviets would know we were spying on them. This brings us to another case, uh, the CIA. In September of 1947, we see the official formation of the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. And their goal is to gather intelligence on foreign nationals. Their goal is to um, find out information about anybody who is, who is doing anything against our government. The other part of the CIA and the other thing that they do are what are called covert operations or secret operations. They try to overthrow anybody that we consider to be an unfriendly government, a government that is not friendly to the United States. And what would constitute an unfriendly government? Well, you guessed it, one that is communist. So we're going to take a look at a journey through the history of Iran. Uh, well, not the whole history, but a, a really um, quick segment. So in uh, 1953, a guy named Mohammad Mogadesh uh, was uh, elected to be the president of Iran, uh, this nation in the Middle East. And Mogadesh, well, he had many communist leanings. Uh, in fact, the biggest thing that they've got going in Iran at the time is oil. And he nationalizes the oil fields. What that means is that he takes them over. He says the government is going to own all the oil, which means that the private companies, mostly owned by the British and the Americans, um, they are no longer going to own their oil companies in Iran. So, of course, this goes against capitalism, and this makes America not too happy. So we put into play uh, what is known as Operation Ajax. So what the United States is going to do is they are going to basically tried to overthrow the government of Iran and put in place their own guy, a guy named the Shah of Iran. So basically, we put the Shah of Iran in charge of Iran. Uh, as soon as the, the Shah gets put in charge, he is going to give the oil fields back to the Western country. So he is going to give us what we wanted back. Essentially, the Shah of Iran is a CIA man. Uh, the Shah put the uh, the Shah was put into power by the United States, and so he is given control by the United States. Um, some people will celebrate. Uh, some people are very happy that he gets put in power. Other people uh, don't like the Shah because, well, he's a pretty nasty dude. He does some pretty nasty things to the people of Iran. He's not exactly a nice guy. Um, in fact, uh, well, he does some pretty bad things as far as human rights goes. But he is not communist, so America is okay with him, uh, even if he's a really nasty dude. Another example of this foreign policy comes in Guatemala. Uh, if we look to Central America, <clears throat> um, the nation of Guatemala uh, basically has a, a communist regime come to power. Communists will come to power, and the United States will train rebels. Uh, they will train a group of people who try to force the president out of office. And, of course, they are successful. They do force the president out of office. And then they put another not-too-nice guy into power. Uh, they put a guy who is essentially uh, a military dictator, what is known as a junta. Uh, so the military dictator will take over. And, again, this guy is not a nice guy. He does some pretty nasty stuff when it comes to human rights. So why do we put up with a guy like this? Well, as you guessed, he is not communist, and that's all that really matters to us. An enemy of my enemy is a friend of mine. So uh, I want to know, uh, what do these actions suggest about the U.S. policy of containment? And, of course, explain your answer. Well, you guessed it. Um, this is showing that we are carrying out our, our policy of containment, and containment, to some extent, is working. We're able to keep these countries from becoming communist. 
course, we do it in a rather illegal way. Um, technically speaking, it's against international law to try to overthrow the government of a, a sovereign nation. Uh, but still, this is communism versus capitalism, so we do what we've got to do. <clears throat> I'll leave it to you to judge whether these were the right or wrong actions. That leads us to one more situation, uh, the U-2 spy plane incident. So the U-2 spy plane is a very top secret plane. It's a high altitude plane, and it is one that can fly um, so high that it can't be detected by radar, at least so we think. And so the U-2 spy plane is going to fly over the Soviet Union, fly over Russia, and everywhere they go, they are going to take secret pictures. Um, they want to know where the missile sites are, they want to know where the Soviets have their missiles so that we can aim our missiles at their missiles. And so these flights would fairly regularly fly across the Soviet Union, they would spy on the Soviets, and well, the Soviets had no idea we were there, or at least so we thought. So these spy planes are making their way across the Soviet Union, um, they're going to do that um, beginning in 1955, but eventually the Soviets figure it out. Uh, they've got enough spies where they know what's going on, not to mention that our, as technology advances, they're able to detect our planes. So by 1958, the Soviets know that we are flying these secret flights over the country taking pictures. So they do what anybody does, they respond with, you guessed it, missiles. Um, they're gonna use what are called surface-to-air missiles. Uh, these are rather large missiles that will be used to shoot at planes and try to sink shoot them, uh, shoot the planes down and, and knock them down. Now, as the legend goes, and this is what legend says, is that President Eisenhower wanted to discontinue this program, that the program was going to be canceled, but the military officials said, please, 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 just one more flight, just one more. We're, we'll be done. We promise we just need one more set of intelligence. And on that reported last flight, May 15, 1960, an American plane takes off it flies over, oh, and if you can guess, well, it gets shot down. Now, was this the last planned flight? Eh, probably not, but at least the Americans are claiming that it is our last flight. So when this gets shot down, it's a huge embarrassment for the United States because uh, at first we deny it, and, and then it turns out, well, they've got a whole lot of evidence. Uh, in fact, they use this evidence as propaganda about how bad America is. They put this stuff on display. Uh, even Nikita Khrushchev, uh, the, the president of the Communist Party, the, the, the head of the Soviet Union, even he will visit this wreckage. And if you go on the close-up trip to Washington, D.C., you could see pieces of the wreckage as well. And so these are part of the YouTube uh, spy plane that was shot down. Uh, now, to be fair, the name of the pilot was a guy named Francis Gary Powers. Uh, again, he was the last one supposed to, to do these flights. And one of the things that all spies were taught was that if you get caught, if your spy plane crashes, uh, you've got a secret poison pill that you're supposed to take in. Well, you're supposed to take your own life. You're supposed to commit suicide. That way, they can't torture or interrogate you. But on this day that Francis Gary Powers went down, he decided that um, it is, much as he loved his country, he didn't really feel like dying that day, so he didn't take the pill. And he is put on trial for espionage in the Soviet Union, where they very publicly embarrass him and the United States. Uh, eventually, uh, he is found guilty, uh, no surprise there, and he is given a 10-year sentence. He is sentenced to 10 years in prison. Now, eventually, uh, he won't actually serve those 10 minutes. Um, well, you may have thought that after we put the Rosenbergs to death, the Soviets would put him to death. But it turns out we had some other Soviet spies that they wanted back, so we ended up doing a little trade, and the rest is history. So there's just a little bit of look on the spies and espionage that you can see during the Cold War. Um, there is the American Cryptology Museum. Uh, it's just outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, potentially, we could go on that if you go on the close-up trip. Um, but there are also all kinds of other resources on Cold War spies. There are tons of History Channel specials out there. Um, but it, it ends up being a really nasty game between us and the Soviets. So more on that later, but for now, I hope you have a wonderful day.